grace where grace really is amazing. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements this morning. First off, for those of you who are on our email list, uh, you know that we are getting involved this year again with Operation Christmas Child. There was a message sent out. If you want to get that message and you're not on our email list, talk to me. I'll put you on our email list and you'll get all that. Uh, this month in particular, we are gathering up school supplies, but there is also a, not a GoFundMe, what is that? Sign up. sign up Genius. Yeah, one of those websites. A Sign Up Genius so that we can sign up and not step on each other's toes as we give gifts to children who would not get Christmas gifts otherwise and give them the gift of Jesus as well. In two weeks, it's Labor Day. The week after that, everything gets started up here. Uh, last week, I gave this huge list. I tried to just run through really fast. Everything gets started. I want to highlight one of the Bible studies that we're going to be starting up Thursdays. Um, our synod, Wells, has asked Pastor Stephen Lane to write a Bible study entitled Unashamed, a Bible study on human sexuality. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on among, around sexuality in our world, and if we don't teach that, if we don't teach what God says, then we will pick up what the world says about it. And so this Bible study is really important. Now, Pastor Lang has asked us to beta test that Bible study, which is actually a really big honor. Basically, it means that we get a sneak preview of it before it gets published, and we get to give input on this is what's good and this is what doesn't work. So we actually get to serve our entire church body by helping and testing this out. Now that's going to be Thursdays at 7, starting after Labor Day. And as I started talking to individuals about this, uh, one of the questions I was asked is, can we do this in person instead of online? Thursdays we usually do an online Bible study. If you are interested in going to that Bible study and you have an opinion on being in person or online, please let me know. Um, so that we can figure that out before, you know, the first week we're supposed to have it. Otherwise, it would be really confusing. Um, so, again, let me know if you want that in person or online. Third announcement, third and last announcement this morning. Um, for those of you who are on the altar guild, um, there are some napkins that we use for communion, for, like, drying up wine and stuff. And people take that home and wash them. And people have forgotten to bring them back. If that's you, please do bring them back because we are running low on those. So, yes, that's the last announcement. Today, we are finishing up our sermon series, Suffering for the Name, as we finish walking with Paul through his first missionary journey. And today we're going to sum up the whole series. We're going to see that it is necessary. Through much hardship, we enter the kingdom of God. And that can be really scary, and so our first song today is a song of comfort, as we say, you know what, it is well with my soul. Let's begin with singing, When Peace Like a River.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and with repentant hearts. So let's acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. We confess together. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and have failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He's given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, Maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power. Keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Lord, I'm
We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they preached the word in Perga, they sailed down to Adaliah. From Adaliah, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. <coughs> On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and how he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This is God's word. We're going to continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 62, where we confess we find rest in God alone. We'll sing the refrain and speak the verses responsibly. That's why the world hates you. 
Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours also. They'll treat you this way because of my name. For they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they've seen these miracles, and yet they've both hated me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. This is God's gospel. most recently at our, uh, our church picnic, actually, that we had about a month ago, I just sat back and I looked at everyone that was there talking to one another, Christian fellowship, and people enjoying time together and laughing, and it was just... <sighs> if you identify with that feeling at all, you can identify with what Paul was going through as he looked over the city of Derby has nothing to do with the Kentucky Derby. I'm sorry, it's not Derby Day. The city was just named Derby. That was just the name of the city. And this is the first city that we get to in, in Paul's journeys where we're not told of any hardships. Uh, we're not told of anyone rejecting him, exiling him, speaking abusively about him, physically abusing him. 
It says they welcomed him. They welcomed Barnabas, the other guy that was traveling with him, and they listened to what they spoke about Jesus, and they were excited about it. And so Paul looks over the city and just... <sighs> he looks at Barnabas. Another city. And Barnabas shakes his head. Paul. It's time to go home. Paul nods. Time to go home. But we should stop and visit all the churches that we, that we started on the way. Barnabas agrees. And so they head back to Lystra, the city you heard about last week, that they stoned Paul, thought he was dead, left him a bloody smear, and Paul barely escaped with his life. And they go back there. And Paul gathers up the Christians, those that trust Jesus. And in the firelight, they see the still healing scars on his face. And Paul tells them, it is necessary to go through much hardship to enter the kingdom of God. And they see that sermon writ all over his body. They knew him. They knew what he had suffered. And they were encouraged. Which is kind of weird, huh? Hey, by the way, you're going to have a terrible time. Thanks. I feel great. And yet, it was encouragement. Because it meant that when they suffered, it wasn't because God hated them. It was because they stood with Jesus and the world hated Jesus, so the world was going to hate them. When they suffered, it wasn't because God was punishing them, because they knew that all that punishment had landed on Jesus on the cross. There was no punishment left. When they suffered, it wasn't because they had, to, they had to hurt a little bit to get some of the sins off of them. Because when Jesus died, he cried out, it is finished. And it was. All their sins, everything they'd ever done wrong, paid in full. When they suffered, it's because they stood with Jesus. And so that was encouragement. That, yeah, we're going to suffer, but it's not because of us. And then Paul looked at them and said, you know, we can't leave them without someone. Barnabas leans in. How about elders? Yeah. Let's appoint some elders. And, and so Paul and Barnabas looked over the church and they said, oh, you know the Bible really well. You have a heart of love. You have the gift to be able to speak God's word well. We're going to appoint you. You guys watch over this group of Christians. And they left Lystra and they went to Iconium, the city that had tried to stone Paul and they had barely escaped. And the people gathered together and Paul said, it is necessary to go through much hardship. And the people knew. And the people knew that Jesus was worth it because he had suffered for them. And then Paul went to Iconium, the city that had exiled him, that had spoken abusively and told lies about him. And Paul said, it is necessary to go through much hardship. And the people knew it. They had heard the lies that had been spoken about Paul, but they knew that God spoke the truth. That for everyone who lied about them, God said, you are my child. You are forgiven. You are my dear one. And then they made the voyage home. They got home, and they gathered the church together, the church that had commissioned them, and sent them out, and they said, Hey, God used us. So many more people know about Jesus now, and the church celebrated. And that is the end of Paul's first missionary journey. And maybe you know, by my phrasing, his first missionary journey, th there was more. The Bible talks about three missionary journeys. It hints that there was a fourth. It doesn't say for sure. Maybe you grew up, uh, when I grew up, there was Sunday school, and we had maps, and there were maps of Paul's missionary journeys, so you could trace them all over the ancient world. This was only the beginning for Paul. It was the end of the first missionary journey, but he would go out again, and he would suffer a lot more. And he said, 
worth it. Because Paul knew how great a sinner he was. Maybe you've seen this theme through the series that Paul said that Jesus was worth so much because Jesus had suffered so much for him. Paul said, I'm not worth that. And Jesus said, yeah, you are. I die for you to take your sins away, to make you right with my Father. Yes, you matter. And Paul was so overwhelmed with that that when he suffered for Jesus, he said, worth it. And now I'm going to turn that around on you. What is Jesus worth to you? And I'm not saying that to guilt you. Jesus died to take your guilt away. If you're feeling guilty, go to Jesus. He's taking your guilt away. But when I say that, what is Jesus worth to you? Maybe you feel guilty because there is something to repent of. To say, Jesus, help me. Some of you know the first commandment. Any of you know it off the top of your head? First commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And then you get the ex- explanation. You shall ear, love, and trust in God above all things. Is Jesus worth it? Well, he's supposed to be. It's the first commandment. Is Jesus worth it to me? Is Jesus worth feeling awkward? Ugh, I don't want to do that. I think often enough times in, at least for me, it'd be a lot easier if someone held a gun to my head and asked, do you believe in Jesus? I'd say yes to that. But feeling awkward? <sighs> Ugh. I don't want to feel awkward. Is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth speaking to a friend, losing a friend, breaking a relationship, losing a job, hurting, giving up time, giving up energy? And I look at that and I have to repent. I have to look at that and say, Jesus, I don't treat you like you're worth it. And Jesus says to you and he says to me the same thing he says to Paul. I know your sin, and I've set you free from it. I've paid for it with my own precious blood, my innocent suffering and death. I've paid for you. I hold you in the palm of my hand, and I say, worth it. I don't look at you and say, oh, man, this wasn't a good deal. Worth it. I love you that much. Get to know Jesus, and you're going to end up saying, like Paul, worth it. And when you fail, you go back to Jesus, and you're going to say, worth it again. Yeah, we're going to suffer. You stand with Jesus, you're going to suffer. But I'm going to encourage you today. Worth it. Amen? Let's stand. Now the peace of God that is better than anything we can understand will give your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he returns to bring you home to life everlasting. Amen. Let's speak a summary of what Christians believe. Today we're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered 
treasures. For that reason, we gather an offering. There's a plate in the back. Feel free to make use of that if you'd like. If you'd like to give electronically, ask me, and I will connect you with the people who know how, because that's not me. If you're our guest, don't feel any obligation to give. This is one of the ways that we as a congregation say, worth it. You're our guest. Don't feel any obligation to give. For now, let's continue with prayer. Lord Jesus, you amaze us. You gather us together as your church, and you tell us your truth, that though we are sinners, you died for us. Fill us with awe and wonder. Fill us then with motivation as well to live as your children, to love you and to love the people around us. Give us wisdom to know how to do that best. Lord, we ask that you send your angels to bring to, to keep our schools safe. As schools have begun, there are so many things that can go wrong in our broken world. Send your angels. Be with students and staff. Bless them and bless our land through them. Lord, we ask that you be with those who have been hurt by the, fire, by the fires in Maui. Be there. Again, send your angels. Protect from those who would use the situation to abuse and instead protect Use this especially as a time to give us opportunities to, to witness to your love, to be your hands and arms in this broken world. Hear us as we bring you our private prayers.
announcements. One, Operation Christmas Child, check your emails. Two, let me know if you want to be at that Bible study Thursday night in person or online. And three, if you happen to, to take something home to watch it that belongs to the church, please do return it. It's easy enough to forget, so this is your reminder. The Lord be with you till we meet again. Oh, no, I have another announcement. I think we ought to thank Carrie for doing the stairs. They look really nice. This last week, Carrie uh, finished the stairs over here, painted, stained them. Um, so if you want to go through an emergency exit or circle the church and look at them from the bottom, they are complete and done really well. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie.